Like a Good Thriller, Richard Flanagan's book Toxic, published in 2021, is set on a faraway scenic island called Tasmania, south of mainland Australia. Everyday life appears to be idyllic, even peaceful and harmonious, where everyone felt it was one of those special magical places where penguins nested under our shack. And there are the usual ingredients an engaging thriller needs to be a page turner. There are decent local residents, farmers, artists and small business owners who want to live and let live. Communities and scientists who argue and research to improve and protect the local way of life, their environment and livelihoods. The author is one of them. And there is the dubious, semi-corrupt, illegal, in short, toxic corporate network of bullying, grossly inadequate regulation and questionable political influence, which the subtitle of the book refers to as the rotting underbelly of the salmon industry. With that said, the arc of suspense is drawn. The story spans a good 30 years, over which several murders quietly occur, for which, mysteriously, no one seems to be responsible. The victims? Nature in the form of Tasmania's clean, green and healthy environment, civil society, encompassing the political rights of ordinary citizens and their trust in public processes and governmental regulation to protect their livelihoods. The culprits? Governments and powerless or silenced bureaucrats that put corporate before public interest. Capitalist greed that comes in the shape of an industry parading as clean, green and healthy that does the exact opposite, namely environmental destruction in service of producing a highly artificial but profitable protein, salmon. The issue with this thriller is that it is not fiction. It is real. It is fact-based. It is unfolding right now. Toxic is a shockingly eye-opening piece of investigative journalism. And it gets paradoxically better and or worse when you realize as a reader that you are also one of the authors of the yet unwritten ending of the story. It is the economic and political power that rests in our hands as workers, consumers and citizens that should, one assumes, play no small part in whether or not the Tasmanian salmon industry succeeds with its plan to double in size over the next decade. Is this just a local Australian story or is there more to this? What Flanagan's Toxic reveals is a web of capitalist paradoxes of global dimensions. These are the result of 30 or more years of neoliberal politics of deregulation and privatization. How the Tasmanian salmon industry operates is symptomatic of global supply chain capitalism and how it not only reaches but oversteps the world's social, technological and certainly ecological limits. Toxic is about the local manifestations of those global capitalist paradoxes. What's a paradox? A paradox is a situation where the chances to achieve a goal are diminished by the very attempt to achieve it. Put differently, the attempt to realize certain intentions creates conditions that run counter to being able to realize those very intentions. The objective to improve a situation, maximize an outcome, minimize costs or increase a benefit leads to the exact opposite, its depreciation and deterioration. The Tasmanian salmon industry, as described by Richard Flanagan, is a paradox defined by the relentless pursuit of economic growth that requires ever more industrial efforts until they reach a tipping point at which these very efforts cause their own unsustainability. And all of this occurs at the expense of an ever more deteriorating natural environment. A simple question at the end of the book serves as case in point. A fish that cannot live in our waters lives in our waters? This question exhibits the most fundamental paradox on which the Tasmanian salmon industry is built, namely that from the beginning Atlantic salmon were the wrong species in the wrong environment. No self-perpetuating population of Atlantic salmon in the wild was ever established. Salmon is not native to Tasmania. Being made aware of this, the Tasmanian government in 1985 nevertheless established the salmon enterprise of Tasmania, Saltos, as Tasmania's first salmon producing company, with the Tasmanian government itself as the majority owner. Saltos essentially became a company called Tassel, which majority owns Saltos now, together with Huon Agriculture and Petuna, the three main salmon producers in Tasmania. 
With this move, the Tasmanian government used its political power to sustain an economic project that is ecologically unsustainable. This development is not surprising when understood as a hallmark of neoliberalization, the creation of a market by the Tasmanian government for the production of salmon, when natural resources become mere commodities that would, over the course of 30 odd years, be increasingly beyond public control. The paradox that comes to the fore here is that the very public and political processes that are in place to protect public interests weaken and subvert themselves to a point where senior bureaucrats simply state, I can't do anything in the face of Tassel's power. This shift from public controlled processes to what the salmon industry calls adaptive management has a way of seeping through the book. Flanagan provides the key sentence, which defines the issue when he writes that rule breakers had through an incomprehensible metamorphosis become rule makers and the new rules seemed made not by parliament, but by a profit and loss ledger. This is in essence what deregulation as a defining feature of neoliberalism really means but more accurately should be called re-regulation in favour of corporate power and profit-making. In a book called How Democracies Die, Levitsky and Siblat describe exactly that process when they write, The erosion of democracy takes place piecemeal. Each individual step seems minor. Indeed, governments' moves to subvert democracy frequently enjoy a veneer of legality. They are approved by a parliament. What appears incomprehensible becomes quite comprehensible on the basis of two examples that Flanagan describes, the Environment Protection Authority, EPA, and the Marine Farming Planning Review Panel, MFPRP. When the public complained at some point about the bad taste and smell of drinking water in Hobart, Tasmania's capital, the EPA decided to spend millions of water users' money to address a problem that would appear to have been in no small part created by the salmon industry. The public was not protected, but made to pay. What Flanagan refers to as hidden subsidies is in economic terms a case of externalities. Neither the political nor the corporate players were held accountable for the damage caused to the environment, and a third party, the public, who has to not only suffer from the consequences, but fund their repair. Similarly, when the MFPRP for the first time in its history refused a plan by Tassel for the expansion of a fish farm, a scientist on the panel not in favour of the expansion was simply replaced with one who was. Moreover, a week later the Tasmanian government legislated, or should we say re-regulated, that the power to approve or reject a new fish farm belonged no longer with the panel, but with the minister. It also became clear that some members of the panel were regularly consulting with senior salmon industry figures. When it came to the panel's vote for or against recommending the approval of an expansion to the minister, two further scientists on the panel, who had advised against it, quit out of protest. Without them, the panel had lost its quorum for a legitimate vote. Without hesitation, two members whose terms had expired were asked to vote a move without ethical basis and of dubious legality. The incomprehensible metamorphosis, the re-regulation was complete, where the panel existed merely as window dressing. The hollowing out of public and political process is not the end of the story. Ordinary citizens themselves are threatened, bullied, intimidated and silenced with money so they would not speak out against the salmon industry. Flanagan provides numerous examples where the use of contracts to buy the silence of those who feel they have had their lives devastated has proven to be a well-tried and successful tactic by the salmon industry. Under the banner of corporate social responsibility, the Tasmanian salmon industry acts irresponsibly, unethically and immorally. Flanagan is careful to present the story not just as yet another corporate scandal, the real story, he writes, is one of a failure of governance, which manifested in the form of a lax, entirely inadequate regulatory regime and a lack of transparency, non-critical political support and overzealous legislative protection, all of which ensured the industry's survival. But salmon has something that people want as part of a healthy diet, namely omega-3 oils. 
As a carnivore, it is salmon's diet of wild fish that creates the high levels of omega-3. To keep this nutritional value as a selling point when kept in captivity, Tasmanian salmon were largely fed on anchovy-based fish meal and fish oil imported from Peru. The very local branding of Tasmanian salmon as clean, green and healthy is thus part of a global, unethical and unhealthy supply chain. The paradox becomes quite clear from Tassel's claim that it uses 1.73 kilograms of wild fish to make one kilogram of salmon. In other words, a lot more protein to produce a lot less. There is hardly a better demonstration of what unsustainability means. There is an existential paradox involved here by increasing the economic efficiency and profitability, the very environmental conditions and resources to do so are being destroyed. What is economically efficient is not ecologically sustainable, it requires ever more industrial efforts to keep this process going. This involves the further web of paradoxical processes which Flanagan one by one brings out. To locally produce more salmon in Tasmania as part of a healthy diet for people in Australia leaves Peruvians in poverty, their children sick and their environment badly damaged. Better food here? Depleted life chances, to use Max Weber's term, there. This is another paradox that extends beyond local Peruvian issues and seeps in many forms through the topic. In order to import the fish feed, ethoxyquin, a banned food additive, is mixed in. Apart from its use being illegal, it is also unhealthy. The result is unpalatable grey flesh that industrially produced salmon has and which needs to be fed a synthetic red dye to make it look like wild fish. Not to forget the abuse of antibiotics to make the salmon survive, deteriorating conditions in which it naturally could not survive. The multitude of paradoxical issues involving every link in the global supply chain is simply staggering. In the meantime, the only problem the Tasmanian salmon industry had with fish meal was cost. To reduce this very cost, Tasmanian salmon was increasingly fed remnants of slaughtered cows, sheep and chickens and high-protein vegetable matter such as lupin, wheat, canola and soy, all of which sourced through equally problematic and paradoxical global supply chains defined by the same grotesque, interrelated horrors. Slavery, forced labor, indigenous dispossession, massive chemical fertilizers and pesticide regimes, destruction of globally unique forests, megafires to say nothing of the extraordinary impacts on global heating. All the while the consumer of salmon is not told that with those changes in the salmon's diet, the level of omega-3 oils in salmon decrease by between 30 to 50%. The loss occurs in multiple ways along the global supply food chain. Only 10% of the energy humans could gain from eating grains are converted into edible protein and fed to animals. And the loss is even greater when those animals are then fed to salmon. Once again, a clear example of what unsustainability means. The cost-efficient industrialized production of food sold with an emphasis on health benefits is simultaneously unhealthy, unethical, and environmentally unsustainable. Industrialization as a defining feature of modern societies turned many small-scale processes of everyday life into processes of mass production. It is from that viewpoint that Flanagan writes, the Tasmanian Atlantic salmon is the battery hen of the sea. He observes that the great enduring paradox was that the more people turned away from industrial land-based protein, the more they embraced industrial sea-based protein. The reasons for these are simple, because the cruelties and crimes of the salmon industry were mostly underwater, unseen, almost invisible. Amongst the cruelties involved in the industrial production of salmon are processes like bathing on giant factory ships, where salmon would be mechanically vacuumed from their nets into bladders, flushed there in a soup of fresh water that killed the saltwater amoeba vacuumed up again and pumped back into their salt water pens. Similarly, there is a process called venturation, where heavy machinery is used to oxygenate the increasingly warmer water in which salmon cannot survive. There is the example of seals and white pointer sharks that are naturally attracted to salmon as a source of food. In order to stop their interference with the salmon production, the industry uses so-called seal crackers or seal bombs 
which literally blow up seals and that negatively affects other wildlife such as dolphins and whales. Chromosomal alterations are used to sterilize some of the salmon turning them into so-called triploids. And finally, if all of this is not paradoxical enough, there is this issue with jellyfish, which kill salmon in hundreds of thousands. The techniques used to remove them multiplies them in the long run, which demonstrates very pointedly again how paradoxical and unsustainable these processes are. But most importantly, it shows how these industrial efforts might soon reach a tipping point where the industry's supreme irresponsibility and commitment to profit, no matter the environmental damage, will prove to be unsustainable. The sheer effort to keep this industry going results not only in a massive deterioration of the environment, but extinction. To be clear, this is not a warning, but reality. No industrial effort of whatever magnitude can extract anything from something that is no longer there. In the meantime, people are trying to find some key that might open the door to some justice, some right as a citizen to not have life ruined by the greed of a corporation. All of this, so it is sometimes argued, is the price we have to pay for the creation of jobs, of employment opportunities. But just like the clean, green and healthy image of the Tasmanian salmon industry, that year of job growth is a myth as Flanagan demonstrates. As with anything that is seriously capitalist, the equation has to be many more fish equal more profit, but it will mean very few new jobs. Just like fish meal, jobs are a cost that is to be minimized. Is there any hope? Flanagan predicts that in 5 to 15 years, but not that far away, the industry will become land-based and the state's salmon industry will collapse. According to Flanagan, a land-based salmon industry is already emerging in places like Saudi Arabia, South Korea, China, Sweden, Russia, Japan, Iceland, Norway, Africa, the US, Vietnam and Canada, just to name a few. And Australian salmon producers have also started looking into alternative production practices. There are no doubt many benefits in this approach. The destruction of the marine ecosystem, the biggest issues, can be drastically reduced. Renewable energy can be used, production can be moved closer to major, often urban markets, reducing the need for transportation. Altogether, the carbon footprint can be reduced and salmon can be marketed as local, greener and cleaner, more sustainable and more environmentally friendly. And yet, Flanagan's outlook seems a little simplistic, since the root causes of all the issues mentioned in the book remain. A land-based salmon industry, just like any other profit-seeking industry, will operate on the principles of mass production and an economic growth model, where more fish means more money, more fish requires the exploitation of more natural and human resources beyond sustainable levels. Toxic explains the paradox how a fish that cannot live in our waters lives in our waters by demonstrating how something seemingly so natural might just be technologically contrived. It reveals what social, political and ecological damage is caused by the pursuit of profit, the complete disregard for the environment and the exploitation of animals and humans alike. Ultimately, the lesson that Toxic conveys it's not just about the issues caused by a local salmon industry. If salmon is the fish that lives in waters in which it cannot live, then capitalism is the system or might be the system in which human beings can at some point no longer live, as it depletes the very conditions of human life, let alone animal life. As Karl Polanyi wrote, to allow the market mechanism to be sole director of the fate of human beings and their natural environment would result in the demolition of society. And we also cannot claim that we did not know. No other than Karl Marx wrote about the issue that lies at the heart of Flanagan's book when he wrote, the essence of the freshwater fish is the water of a river. But the latter ceases to be the essence of the fish and is no longer a suitable medium of existence as soon as the river is made to serve industry, as soon as it is polluted by dyes and other waste products and navigated by steamboats or as soon as its water is diverted into canals, the simple drainage can deprive the fish of its medium of existence. End of quote. A Richard Flanagan book is always a good read, and this one is in particular, since it explains global supply chain capitalism in a way 
and on an issue that is relatable to the everyday person. What makes the book much more than a thriller about yet another corporate scandal is the fact that it mercilessly reveals that the food on your plate is no longer a private issue, but the result of a toxic, paradoxical and capitalist global supply chain, a story in which we all partake and are thus the authors of. And so you cannot put it aside without the sense that capitalism does produce its own grave diggers, to once again quote Karl Marx, unless we find a way to have economic growth that is environmentally and socially sustainable. Toxic makes it clear that the economic growth without environmental sustainability is simply impossible.